Good morning. I am Pastor Kathy Myers. I'm the pastor here at Richmond United Methodist Church. This is the first Sunday of Advent. It is the hanging of the green service. And even though it is not the way we had hoped it would be, uh, this morning it is a quiet sanctuary. But there is uh, something very still and reverent uh, about the space this morning, for we know that you are out there worshiping along with us, and we invite you into this wonderful space of worship. It is our honor, those few of us who are here serving this morning, uh, to let the Lord work through us. Let me invite you to look around your space. Most everybody has a candle somewhere in their house. Let me invite you to locate your candle in a couple of moments when our light bearer Carter comes to light the candles for us on our altar table. Let me invite you to light your candle as we enter into this time of worship. Doris Cox is our liturgist today, and she has a few things to share with us. Good morning. We are glad to have all of you that are worshiping with us this morning. Uh, we have a few announcements. Uh, Sunday, November the 29th, we're worshiping by Zoom. Tuesday, December the 1st, there is a finance meeting. Tuesday, December the 8th at 7 p.m., a trustees meeting. Uh, Tuesday, De be sure and look for information regarding all of our Advent services and plans in your December newsletter. Also, be pleased be sure to check the following sources weekly for information about services and events at RUMC. Check your weekly bulletin, the Facebook, weekly newsletter, and the phone tree. I know there's something exciting coming up for the youth on the 13th, so parents, be sure and look at that. We hope you can join us. those of us here in the sanctuary, those of you worshiping with us at home as the light of Christ enters our worship space. Let me invite you to be seated. Let us share together this litany of the greens. You see your response there. You'll find our bulletin on our website, as well as you'll see the responses on the screen. How can we prepare this house for the coming of Jesus the King? With branches of cedar, the tree of royalty. How shall we prepare this house for the coming of Jesus, the eternal Christ, with garlands of wreaths of pine and fir, whose leaves are ever living, ever green. How shall we prepare this house for the coming of Jesus, our Savior? With arrangements of holly and ivy, symbolizing his passion, death, and resurrection. How shall we prepare this house for the coming of Jesus, the Son of God? By hearing again the words of the prophets, who foretold the saving work of God. How shall we prepare this house, this heart of mine and yours, to receive anew our newborn king that grows to fulfill the law and goodness of God, the one who saves our soul? 
together we shall present ourselves as an offering as we listen learn receive embrace and share the truth that god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved glory to god in the highest In the opening prayer, God, God of manger and star, let us enter your story once again and find ourselves kneeling with the shepherds, singing with the angels, and worshiping with the magi. Touch our hearts with the wonder of birth and the depths of your love. Let us enter the story of Joseph and feel the weight of concern and the joy of love. Let, Let us, us enter, enter the story, story of Mary and, and feel her peace as she trusts beyond comprehension and submits in humble obedience to your way. Speak, speak to us in word and song and, and lift us to the, to the realms, realms of, of glory. glory. Amen. As we uh, share together in our Hanging of Green service, we uh, share a blessing over our Advent wreath before it is lighted. Christ came to bring us salvation and has promised to come again. Let us pray that we may always be ready to welcome him, that the keeping of Advent may open our hearts to God's love, that the light of Christ may penetrate the darkness of sin. May this wreath constantly remind us to prepare for the coming Christ. May the Advent and Christmas season fill us with hope, peace, joy, and love as we strive to follow the example of Jesus. Let us pray together. Loving God, your church joyfully awaits the coming of its Savior, who enlightens our hearts and dispels the darkness of sin. Pour out your blessings upon us as we light the candles of this wreath. May their light reflect the splendor of Christ, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. And now Judy and Morris Salter light our uh, first Advent candle. At the end, they share a prayer together, and we invite you to join along with them. They come to us uh, via video. All we know is that so many things seem like anything but right. Nothing seems like it used to be. We need Advent. We light this first candle as a sign of hope. Hope that you will meet us even in the midst of all that is surrounding us in these days. Let us pray. Holy, Holy One, one we, live we live in the constant, constant hope that, that you, you still, still see, see us. us. Though we may feel lost in the rubble, we know that you are with us. Let this light be the guide that brings us to Emmanuel once more. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen. And now we light our family candle. In the 1970s, 
families from this congregation brought individual candles from their homes to share in the creation of the family candle. This connects us to our church family, to members from the past, the present, and as we give thanks for God for the generations of faithful mem members to follow us. As the family candle is lighted, we give thanks to God for the gift of family in all the many forms it takes as we share the gift of love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There it is. Our Young Disciples moment is the real night before Christmas. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, the tricky clock tick-tocking, each painfully long minute unlocking. The tumbly, jumbly, can't close your eyes feeling. What will it be? When will it be? Oh, the anticipation, the watching, the wishing and waiting to let the wiggles and giggles and goosebumps go. To find, to see, to finally know. What will it be? When will it be? Oh, the expectation, the what-ifs, the oh-mys fairly shaking, longing for this night's joy all year, that moment of hope so very near. Oh, but would they, could they, imagine a gift so great, a gift that compelled the whole world to wait? When a heavenly Father gave all mankind his Son, the one love divine. The magic of Christmas is more brilliant, you see, than a bag or a box tucked under a tree. The true love of Christmas really began when holy God became holy. anticipate his coming to us once again as we sing our carols and our songs this year we will not sing them out loud here in the sanctuary but uh, as you sing at home sing to the top of your lungs if you would like most of us know these wonderful hymns and carols uh, for us here we will quietly sing to ourselves for this season as we continue uh, with social distancing and trying to stay safe, uh, it lends itself to both singing uh, loudly to the glory of God and singing quietly in thanksgiving and gratitude. Our carol is come, thou long expected Jesus.
as we prepare our hearts, prepare our homes, prepare our places of worship. We give thanks to God for all the ways that we prepare, and we will do this week by week as we make our way to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We celebrate the gift of the pyramids. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. We have placed the Advent pyramids, which are purple, blue, and gold, royal colors to remind us of the King of Kings, who came to be the light of the world. And we give thanks to God for the guidance of the Advent wreath. Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The Advent wreath is a vivid symbol of preparation. The lighting of the new candle each of the four weeks before Christmas remind us that something is happening, but more is yet to come. The circle of evergreens remind us of, reminds us of the everlasting covenant offered in the birth of Jesus. The four candles symbolize hope, peace, joy, and love. Each week as each candle is lighted and the light glows brighter, we understand that there is no darkness that our Lord Jesus Christ cannot dispel. His light is sent from God to show us the way of salvation. We give thanks to God for guidance through wreaths and garland. Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, among them a light has shined. For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and he... And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. From ancient times, evergreens have been considered a symbol of eternity, a sign of God's everlasting nature. Isaiah tells us that there will be no end to the reign of the Messiah. Therefore, we hang wreaths shaped in circles and place garlands of green as a sign of everlasting life. These are the symbols of Christ's, Christ's eternal life and the celebration of Christmas itself. And now let us sing quietly or out loud. People look east, verses 1 and 4. The Lord is on the way. 
We give thanks to God for guidance through Holly and Ivy, Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For Christians, this passage from Isaiah reflects on the sufferings of Jesus, who saved us from our sins by his death on the cross and by his resurrection from the dead. In ancient times, holly and ivy were considered signs of Christ's passion. Their prickly leaves suggest the crown of thorns, the red berries, the blood of the Savior, and the bitter bark, the drink offered to Jesus on the cross. As we place the holly and the ivy, let us rejoice in the coming of Jesus our Savior. And we give thanks to God for guidance through the dove. Luke, the second chapter, verse 14. And the angel said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom God favors. The dove has long been viewed as a symbol of peace. The concept of peace covers the Advent and Christmas season. After all, Jesus was born into the world to bring peace between God and humankind. Through the birth, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the final sacrifice for sin was paid. He ushered in the final covenant of peace between God and humankind. When the angel spoke to a peace to all whom God's favor rests, they spoke of Jesus and all who believe in him, trust him, and follow him. May the images of doves during the Christmas season serve as a reminder of the Holy Spirit, who is the seal of peace with God. After all, the true spiritual peace was the purpose for which Jesus was born into the world. And we give thanks to God for guidance throughout this season with the evergreen tree. Scripture from Micah, chapter 5. But you, O Bethlehem, from you shall come forth the one who is to rule Israel, whose origin is from ancient days. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. In ancient times, the cedar was revered as the tree of loyal royalty. It also signified immortality and was used for purification. We have placed this tree in the sanctuary as a symbol of Christ, who reigns as king forever and whose coming will purify our hearts. And now we celebrate the lighting of our tree as we hear God's word from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The true life, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of the blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. As a part of our final preparation for this beginning of the season of Advent, a season of prefecture preparing and waiting for the coming of Jesus, the light of the world, we understand, we remember the past, we prepare for future days, but most of all, we live in the present. 
These present days call us to prepare our hearts, our minds, our homes, our community, our world to receive Christ once again and commit ourselves to his will and way. We are grateful for the chrisman tree filled with symbols of Christian faith that guide our days. In this time of Advent, whenever we see a lighted tree, let it call to mind the one who brings the light into our darkness, healing into our brokenness, and hope and peace to all who receive him. May this tree be arrayed in its beauty and splendor, remind us of the living, giving cross of Christ, that we may always rejoice in the new life that shines in our hearts. I don't know about you if you have a Christmas tree in your home, uh, but what I do know uh, is that in our sanctuary, we have placed a chrismon tree, and as Doris said, the symbols that you see on the tree were created uh, by people of faith in years past, and certainly each and every one of them have significance. And so we ask your blessing, O oh God, over our chrismon tree and over our Christmas trees at home, that each and every time we light them, each and every time we sit in the glow of them, that we are reminded that you, O oh Christ, are the light of the world. You are the light of our lives. And may we spend those moments of strength and peace as we feel your presence among us, most particularly in powerful ways this year. We give you thanks, O oh God. We take a moment to look at all the symbols that we've talked about so far. There are others we didn't speak of today, but we will uh, next week uh, and the following week after that as we continue to prepare our homes, prepare our sanctuary, and prepare our hearts for the coming of the Christ. As we center our hearts as one, we are using liturgy from the canticle of the turning. So let us share together. Our soul cries out with a joyful shout, and the God of our heart is great. And my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the ones who wait. You fixed your sight on your servant's plight, and our weakness you did not spurn. So from east to west shall my name be blessed, could the world be about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Our reading from Psalm today comes from Psalm 80, verses 1 and 3. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. The word of life. Thanks be to God. As we uh, come to share our prayers with uh, one another, I invite you to give thought to all the things that you want to bring to God in prayer. As we pray together as a family of faith, um, I know that there are many things that you are concerned about and things that you celebrate. Uh, I share with you, we always um, have a list in our congregation of people and situations that we want to share with one another, and you will find those um, in our bulletin on our website. Um, and if there is something that you would like to share with us, <clears throat> please don't hesitate to let us know. There is a place on our website where you can share a prayer with us and uh, you can let us know if it's just something you want to share with me personally. I'll be praying along with you. Or if you want to share it with our prayer team or with our entire congregation, uh, we'll be glad to pass that information along if you give us permission to do so. It is our honor to be in prayer along with you. Certainly <clears throat> uh, high on our list of praying together is the fact that we find ourselves back to uh, virtual worship and no longer uh, in-person worship, especially through the season of Advent. Uh, it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that we did the same thing during the season of Lent. <laughs> um, but it does lend itself, I think, to giving 
great thought to how important it is to worship, whether we can gather uh, together in worship or whether uh, we, we uh, worship online and there are just a few of us gathered. And then we're doing a, a study uh, here in our congregation where we're worshiping at home. And so we find ourselves in this study uh, spending moments of worship by ourselves, which is also an extremely important way to worship. So we give thanks to God for all the many ways that there are to worship. And we are very deep in prayer for uh, all of those affected by uh, COVID-19, uh, particularly those who have lost their lives and, and families are grieving that loss. For those who are sick, um, for those who fear uh, in the midst of this, for those whose jobs are affected, uh, just so many things. And so, oh God, we, we pray for a vaccine that uh, we might come to a place where we uh, can be uh, connected to one another again in ways that we long to be so. So we lift up that prayer. Also, I give thanks uh, to God um, that Doris uh, shares with us uh, that we want to be lifting up the family of Gary Short, who passed away yesterday. This is a, a close family friend of both Doris and Carter's and their family. Uh, we just lift up Gary's family and uh, give thanks to God for Gary's life and know that he is safe at home, but certainly for those who will miss him uh, here on earth, we um, ask God's comfort and God's blessing. I know that uh, there are many things that you want to bring before God's throne, and so I just invite you in the quietness of this moment to do that, and then I will pray, um, and then we will pray the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray. Holy God, whenever we sit quiet and still in this sanctuary space, especially when there are so few of us physically here serving, we can't help but hear the ticking of the clock in the back. And it always reminds me of the ticking of every moment and how important it is to live, live every moment for we know that today is all that you have really promised us. And so we must live it strong and well. But it also reminds us of the gift of time, particularly now that is the season of Advent. We prepare in many beautiful ways, but most of all, we prepare our hearts in prayer. As week by week, we light our Advent candles and we are reminded that the gift of the gifts that you give to us in peace and love and joy and hope. Today we lit the candle of hope and we are hopeful, hopeful for a different world, hopeful that we will continue to grow in faith, hopeful that we will make our way all the way home to you, hopeful that we will live into the season of Advent with more strength and courage and joy and thanksgiving than we have ever done before. We are hopeful and know that you hear our prayers and you respond in beautiful ways. God, we give you thanks for this time of worship and for every day as we bring ourselves before your holy throne in worship. We offer ourselves to you. And now we do so as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
please join us in the prayer for illumination. God, we are listening for your encouragement, your hope, and your guidance. Amen. God's word comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter. Let me invite you to stand as we hear the Gospel reading. Please stand at home also. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all all his sisters with us? Where did this man get all these things? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Typically, um, we live into the season of Advent, and as we do so, we usually uh, approach it from uh, the focus of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, And many times we do it as we live into the uh, account of the um, anticipation of the birth of Christ and the birth of Christ in the Gospel of Luke, which is told from the vantage point of Mary. Um, And certainly, we're going to talk about Mary and we're going to learn from Mary uh, throughout this season because um, Advent and Christmas would not be the same without that. How could we ever uh, not hear from our Lord's Mother? But most especially this year, we're going to hear uh, the Advent story uh, from the vantage point of Joseph. And uh, that comes to us most especially from Matthew's account of the Christmas, the Advent Christmas story. Um, And it's kind of interesting that we would still be in the Gospel of Matthew because we just finished focusing on uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And so we have to uh, give thought to um, all the things that Jesus learned from his parents and as we're focused on, particularly on Joseph, we have to wonder, uh, all those things that we just learned about in the Sermon on the Mount, how much of that came from Joseph? How much of it came from things that Jesus learned from him? No man could have ever played a greater role in Jesus' life than Joseph. He was not Jesus' biological father, but he was chosen by God uh, to be Jesus' earthly father. And uh, Joseph did everything that God asked him to do uh, once he received this word from God and he got over his sense of fear. Uh, After that, he did everything that God asked him to do. He protected Mary and Jesus and all of their family. uh, And he listened closely to what uh, God said. And he followed the path that God laid out for them. He certainly taught Jesus and mentored him through his growing years. Now, we don't know a lot about uh, Joseph. Uh, There's not really very much information uh, recorded about him. Uh, There's just a handful of stories and a few scriptures that mention him. And so we have to do uh, what a lot of people do, maybe when... Uh, maybe when we didn't know our grandparents or our great-grandparents very well, we have to, we have to fill in the stories. <laughs> we have to pay attention to the lives of people they touched, and we can learn some things about them from that. And so certainly we can learn a lot of things about Joseph from looking at the life of Jesus. Beginning in the second century, um, long before um, there was very much um, information Uh, written down Um, and Jesus was living into um, uh, he had lived into his childhood Uh, we learn uh, some information from certainly from the gospels that were written at the time Uh, but as people began to try to fill in the gaps in the second century it was as if they felt like they didn't have enough information 
And so they began to try to fill in the gaps a little bit. Um, and scholars wrote what is called the Apocryphal Gospels. Now, Apocrypha in Greek, uh, that word means uh, obscure or hidden. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written in the second half of the first century. The Apocryphal uh, Gospels came much later. Some of you might have the Apocrypha in the center of your Bible. I'm trying to remember, Carter, if our... Uh, confirmation Bible had the Apocrypha in it or not, but a lot of times uh, Bibles will have the Apocrypha in the center, um, and it it certainly um, tells stories uh, about Jesus's family, about a lot of people that uh, Jesus touched in life. Uh, most of the stories are kind of fanciful, and um, they don't really come in line with the first century Jesus that we have learn to know and love but it's not to say that those stories are not true um, they could be true uh, I'll be honest with you I don't spend a whole lot of time reading the Apocrypha because I have enough trouble <laughs> with the canon that we're given <laughs> and the Gospels that we find there and so I don't really spend a whole lot of time reading that but but they are um, a bit interesting for example in the infancy gospel of James, in the infancy gospel of Thomas, they provide some pretty interesting stories about Mary and Joseph. Um, and so I'll just throw that out there, and uh, in the interest of time, I'll let you discover some of those stories for yourself. Uh, again, you read them and you think, well, you never know. You know, it could be true. Uh, the scholars got this from somewhere, and so there is a possibility. But I, I do want us to briefly touch on a piece of uh, biographical information that we have about Joseph uh, from our text in the Gospel of Matthew that I read just uh, a few moments ago. Um, we hear in this particular text, when people began to pay attention to Jesus and his teaching, uh, somebody said, isn't that, isn't that the carpenter's son? Isn't that, isn't that Joseph and Mary's boy? You know, uh, probably as if to almost disregard him because, um, you know, it's a hometown boy and uh, sometimes we have a tendency to uh, maybe think of people that we saw grow up when they do grow up. Uh, I know Rob has talked about this in some of our meetings. Uh, Rob is our trustee chair now, owns a business in the community, uh, is uh, a family man. Uh, and he says that sometimes he almost wonders, particularly in the church, if people don't think of him as little Robbie. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, not to disregard what Rob knows or the way that he lives out his life, but sometimes we can think of folks that way, and we forget, hey, they've gained a lot of wisdom through the years. And even though I've known them since childhood, I need to listen. And so in some ways, that, that's what folks were talking about here. Isn't that Joseph and Mary's boy? You know, as if I just see him in that way. Um, but so we know that Joseph was a carpenter. So uh, let's see what that might tell us about Joseph. Now, the Greek word translated as carpenter is tekton, and it means someone who works with wood. Now, uh, and that's usually how we think of Joseph, someone who works in a wood shop, he works with wood. But in the first century world, uh, most houses were made of stone and mud brick. And though um, a, a tecton could build a house, they usually did not. Uh, usually it was someone else who built houses and built them out of stone or mud brick. A tecton, Joseph, would have been more likely to build shutters or doors to the house, or he would have built farm uh, implements, tools, yoke for oxen, furniture, chests, tables. We see a couple of images on our altar table of maybe some of the tools that Joseph would have built at the time. So whenever we think about carpenters and we think about the things that they would have built, think about a carpenter that you know. Uh, and kind of give thought to the image that you have of them. I don't know about you, but most of the people that I know uh, that work in carpentry, um, they're usually a bit quiet, uh, they're calm, 
most of the time. Um, they um, have a sense about them that you enjoy being around them uh, because they just have this calm spirit. That's what I know about most of the carpenters that, that I know, and that may be the same for you. And so to me, that gives me a little bit of an image of Joseph. Another image that I have of Joseph always comes to me whenever I watch this particular YouTube video. It is a video, um, and in it, it represents the music uh, by a group called Mercy Me. And they are singing a song called Joseph's Lullaby. And in this video clip, you see images of the movie The Nativity, uh, which is more about Jesus' birth. And then you see images of the movie The Passion, which is more about Jesus' passion, about his journey to the cross. And in this particular image, we can't show it to you because of uh, copyright laws. We can't show it live stream, and so I'm just going to describe it to you. So Joseph and Mary are in the stable, and Mary is about to hand Joseph the newborn baby Jesus. Uh, Joseph takes off his cap and lays it in the stable to make a pillow for Jesus' head. And then he takes Jesus with such pride on his face, and he lays him uh, in the manger. And then you begin to see all of these images from those two movies that I mentioned. And so a lot of it is about Jesus and his adult ministry. It's about teaching, and it's about walking that path of faith. And then it's about walking uh, that road to Calvary, that long, difficult road. Uh, it shows a, a couple of flashes of an image of crucifixion. And so as it's showing all these images, uh, we hear Mercy Me singing this song. And these are the words. Go to sleep, my son, this manger for your bed. You have a long road before you. Rest your little head. Can you feel the weight of your glory? Do you understand the price? The Father guards your heart so you can sleep tonight. Go to sleep, my son. Go and chase your dreams. This world can wait for one more moment. Go and sleep in peace. I believe the glory of heaven is lying in my arms tonight. Lord, I ask that he, for just this moment, simply be my child. Go to sleep, my son. Baby, close your eyes. Soon enough, you will save the day. But for now, dear child of mine, oh my Jesus, sleep tight. I would imagine from the very beginning that Mary and Joseph both knew that God had chosen them for two of the most important roles that anyone would ever play in this world, the role of Jesus' earthly parents. I so often think about the fact of the role of Joseph as Jesus' earthly father. And I think about because Joseph was a carpenter, um, that more than likely Jesus grew up in a very hardworking, common household. Um, and I think probably the majority of us can relate to that. I think about all of the gifts that I gained and the lessons I learned from growing up in a very hardworking, common household. And I would imagine that you know some of those same lessons. And so I would imagine that Jesus started out from the very beginning uh, learning those wonderful lessons of working hard and giving it your all and always being honest and following God's way. While there is very little written about Joseph, I believe that we uh, can learn a lot about him by looking at his son. I wonder when Jesus tells us to address God as Abba, something that would be similar to dad or daddy, I wonder if it was Joseph that he was thinking of when he thought about the character of God and how he learned about the character of God from his earthly father, Joseph. When Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son uh, likening God to a merciful father who took his son back after he had squandered everything he had been given, I wonder if Jesus might have seen Joseph do some of these same things with his brothers or his sisters. 
when Jesus spoke of the importance of telling the truth, I wonder if he thought back to all the things that Joseph taught him when he was growing up about the importance of telling the truth. When he taught his disciples, the true greatness is found in humble service. Was he thinking about Joseph and what Joseph did for a living and how hard he worked in such a humble way? When he said that a man is not to look at a woman with lust in his heart, I wonder if he was thinking back to some conversation that he and Joseph might have had when he was a teenage boy. When he said we are to treat others the way we want to be treated, could it be that he was looking at the values of his dad and the way that Joseph lived his life out? Jesus certainly learned much from his mother, but he also learned a great deal from his earthly father, Joseph. It seems very likely that Jesus' um, intentional teaching and modeling of love certainly came from Joseph. And that in turn leads me to ask the question, most particularly of parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles, especially of men who are listening today, how are you intentionally shaping the children entrusted to your care? What are you teaching them about God? What are they learning uh, about how to live their life um, all throughout their life, how to live their life a little further down the road? What, what image of God are you painting for them? Joseph painted an image of God for Jesus throughout his life, and Jesus never forgot it. And it was something that he lived into each and every day. A few weeks ago, our son Brett and our daughter-in-law Amanda uh, told us that um, they are going to be having a baby boy in April. And um, I just, I couldn't help but in that moment when it was revealed that it was a little boy, uh, it brought me to tears. And um, Chuck, my husband Chuck, was standing beside me, and he said, Are you okay? And I said, with uh, a, a choked-up voice, <laughs> I said, Our son is having a son. <laughs> uh, and it, it brings you to this place of wondering, what will Brett teach him about being a man of God? What will Brett teach him about how to live into faith every day of his life? What will, will Brett teach him about how to treat women uh, in the world, women in his life? What will he teach him by the way he treats Amanda or treats me, his mother, or treats Wanda, his grandmother? Uh, what will his son learn about women from the way that he watches Brett live out life? What will Brett and Amanda teach this little boy about faith that he will carry on to the generation to follow? Our influence matters so much more than we could ever imagine that it does. Today we begin the season of Advent. We prepare our hearts to celebrate the Christ child coming to us anew and Christ into the world. But how we wait, what we do with this time, makes all the difference in the world. How do you plan to wait? Let us pray. We wait, O oh God, with hopeful expectation, for we know our Lord is near. Amen. We give thanks to God for showing us uh, the ways of Christmas through the eyes of Joseph. We know one thing that Joseph taught Jesus was uh, the gift of worship as they would travel to the synagogue and the gift of giving of their resources to the work of God. It was an important thing for them to do. And so our Lord was taught that. And then, of course, he in turn taught that to others. And so we uh, give thanks to God for the opportunity uh, to give. And so I pray that as you give thought to um, how you give to the work of God through this church, that you find ways uh, to do that by giving online, by uh, dropping your offering uh, by 
um, so that we can make sure that the ministries uh, continue uh, throughout this time of uh, being physically separated. And we give thanks to God for the opportunity. So now let us sing our thanks quietly. Let us share together our offertory prayer. On this first Sunday of Advent, we consider the building of Jesus' life. We consider the building of our faith. May this offering say something bold and strong about who we are and how we choose to live. May our offerings bring you honor, O God. Amen. And our closing hymn singing loudly at home and quietly here in the bleeding.